Could you imagine living in a country where once a year all emergency services were suspended and you could literally get away with murder? If legalized murder doesn't give you chills, the dystopian film series The Purge is about to get even more real with the latest installment of the series, The Purge Election Year. And perfectly enough, the timing coincides with America's search for their next president. I'm Alan with Cinematica and we're here to freak you out about the future of our country in the most entertaining way possible. Are you a diehard Purge fan? Just wondering if it's worth a watch? We've got something for everyone as we count down the hundred and seven facts you should know about the Purge franchise. For instance, did you know Sarge was modeled after the outlaw Josie Wales, a 1976 drama action flick starring Clint Eastwood? Yup, there's more of that good stuff coming your way. Let's get started. Number 1. As a way of celebrating America, The Purge Election Year was set to be released on the week of Independence Day. Number 2. The Purge franchise has been produced by the production companies Blumhouse Productions and Platinum Dunes. Blumhouse Production is known for paranormal activity, sinister, and unfriended, and Platinum Dunes is headed by the Transformers director Michael Bay. Platinum Dunes has also produced famous horror film remakes including Friday the 13th, Texas Chainsaw Massacre, and A Nightmare on Elm Street. Number 3. The Purge series was written and directed by James DeMonico. He's also written the Negotiator and Skinwalkers, and is the creator and writer of select episodes for The Kill Point. Number four, film producer Jason Blum was an ideal collaborative partner for DeMonico. He describes Blum being the Roger Corman of our time because he elevates classic B movie stories. Number five, DeMonico also wrote the Salt on Precinct 13 remake, which is where he met Purge producer Sebastian Lemercier. Election Year was Lemercier and DeMonico's fifth film together. Previous collaborations included Assault on Precinct 13, Little New York, and of course The Purge and The Purge Anarchy. Number 6. In an early draft of The Purge, DeMonico included a full explanation of The Purge's history, detailing the country's steps in spawning it, such as legalizing drugs and guns. DeMonico admitted it was heavily and ridiculously elaborate. Number 7. DeMonico was going to share The Purge's history online to provide a more interactive experience for fans. He was given a decent budget to get it done, but due to time constraints, it was never completed. Number 8. There are also several written web episodes that were never shot that explored The Purge universe. They showed some of the ceremonies involved in preparation for the event. One instance would be small children getting protective purge gear as a Christmas present. Santa must have thought they were extra nice that year. Number 9. All this backstory was for nothing though. DeMonico's producers told him that he couldn't stop working on the movie itself to make the history and the webisodes and just advised him to allow the audience to fill in the blanks themselves. Number 10. It remains unclear why the purge was placed into effect in the first place, but according to Purge History, in 2019 an amendment was added declaring crime legal for 12 hours once a year as an answer to the homeless epidemic in 2014. Just don't think too hard about that one. Number 11. DeMonico says that the first purge was an experiment in Ohio. Then they expanded it to 10 cities and eventually across the world. Number 12. There are several reasons why the purge is set in March. March 21st is the beginning of spring, otherwise known as the spring equinox. It also happens to be DeMonico's sister's birthday. Plus he thought it was a cool way of symbolizing the propaganda about cleansing and rebirth and baptism. Number 13. The idea for the series actually stemmed from a shared near-death experience between DeMonico and his wife. One night they were driving the Brooklyn Queens Expressway and a drunk driver cut them off, almost killing them. DeMonico and the drunk driver later got into a fight and the drunk driver had no remorse for almost killing them. When DeMonico and his wife returned to the car, DeMonico's wife responded jokingly, what if we got one free one a year? The idea always stuck with him. Number 14. In addition to his near-death experience, DeMonico also credits his experience living outside of the US as inspiration for the series. After moving away from Brooklyn and residing in France, DeMonico noticed America's gun lust in comparison to the rest of the world. In Brooklyn, he claimed that 9 out of 10 people he knew owned guns. Number 15. The Purge story was originally intended to be a politically subversive art house film written as a morality tale of a rich family on the night of the Purge. DeMonico and his producer thought it would just premiere at a small indie theater in Los Angeles in New York. Number 16. DeMonico admits he never expected Universal Studios would approach him with the request to release the Purge commercially, especially since he feared the idea was a little anti-American. Number 17. It was always DeMonico's intention for racial politics to be heavily present early on in the series, but Universal requested that those scenes be removed as well as many scenes portraying brutal family-on-family -family violence. Number 18. Producers told James that The Purge was becoming too political back when he first had the idea to do The Purge Anarchy. Luckily, Universal Studios supported the idea from the start and now screenwriter DeMonico has taken it to the next level with Purge Election Year. Number 19. Although it's dubbed horror, The Purge was always intended to be more of an action flick, which is the direction 
Christian DeMonaco still strives for with the franchise. In his mind, the film is more comparable to the 70s cult classic The Warriors. Number 20. The director is heavily influenced by legendary filmmaker John Carpenter. In fact, the Purge series was partially inspired by the film Escape from New York. Number 21. The idea of the proper rich characters hunting down the poor was inspired by a Greenway film the producers had watched. They wanted to bring a British element into the franchise and showcase murder for sport. Number 22. Is it just me or does hearing the emergency broadcast siren make your heart rate accelerate too? The anxiety causing siren was actually inspired by the siren in Steven Spielberg's War of the Worlds. Number 23. Nathan Whitehead composed the sounds we hear throughout The Purge and he does such an extraordinary job keeping the creep factor up. When asked how he decided the mood, he says there's so much tension and fear among the first family in The Purge, so creating this dark textural world with the music just felt like it reflected the inner struggle in an interesting way. He continued to say that in this world, the dark sort of claustrophobic sounds just seemed to be right. Number 24. Whitehead also revealed he doesn't attach musical themes to a character, but he will attach a theme to a situation or thematic elements that happen throughout the film. Number 25. Whitehead has worked as composer for Transformers Dark of the Moon, Gears of War, and Desperate Housewives. He's also an ASCAP composer for film, television, and video games. ASCAP is the American Society of Composers, Authors, and Publishers. Number 26. In his first draft of The Purge, DeMonico had written it with satirical undertones. He ultimately shifted away from the style because he was concerned that if he made it comedic, the film wouldn't resonate with audiences. In the end, DeMonico wanted audiences to empathize with the family and imagine themselves experiencing The Purge. Number 27. The Purge psychopaths are all inspired by serial killer Charles Manson. DeMonico is obsessed with Manson and claims everything he writes stems from what he knows about him, as well as his love for the show True Crime. Number 28. DeMonico had to tap into some dark places to write the characters for The Purge. He even had to take some time off before writing The Purge election year to get out all of these violent thoughts. Number 29. DeMonico wasn't sure he wanted to do a third installment in the franchise. It took him coming up with the right story before he would commit to production. Number 30. In the world of The Purge, everyone is a killer, and society is forced to be polite in hopes of avoiding grudges. It's been described as a reality that's as comparable and strangely off-putting as The Stepford Wives. Number 31. Rumors began that the third sequel of The Purge franchise would actually be a prequel centered around the very first Purge. It was producer Jason Blum who was really excited over the idea, but to dismiss the rumors, Bradley Fuller, co-owner of Platinum Dunes, had to announce that the prequel was a no-go. Number 32. While writing the screenplay, DeMonico carefully studied politics and cleverly decided to schedule the film's release during an election year to boost promotion. Number 33. Despite the timing, DeMonico didn't know that this story would come so very close to political figures we know today in 2016. He says, the audience may find certain attributes of his characters rather familiar. I wonder who he's referring to. Number 34. The script for election year was completed in 2014 and officially announced just a month after the sequel premiered in theaters. What is this, Marvel? Keep popping those babies out. Number 35. Universal Pictures put out a political campaign ad for The Purge as a promotional tool. It details American citizens talking about why they choose to purge and why it's good for America. It's as creepy and unsettling as it sounds. They even have stickers saying, I purged on their chest, resembling the I voted sticker citizens receive after they cast their votes in real life. Number 36. An eerily realistic pro-purge campaign TV spot cleverly made its debut during the commercials of a GOP debate and was dubbed too realistic by many CNN viewers. At the end of the TV spot, you'll notice the slogan To keep my country great. Sound familiar? Number 37. Production officially began on Wednesday, September 16th, 2015. In addition to Washington, D.C., election year was filmed in the small town of Woonsocket, Rhode Island, which served as a stand-in for D.C. Other movies that were also filmed in Woonsocket include Dumb and Dumber, A Chico, A Dog's Tale, and Brotherhood. Number 38. Between extras and local businesses, there were around 900 Woonsocket residents getting a check from production. Even shops that halted business because the area cut off pedestrian access were happy to be seen on the big screen. Get that money, Woonsocketants. Number 39. Let's go back and talk some dates, shall we? The Purge election year takes place two years after the Purge anarchy. The year will be 2025. The first Purge movie took place in 2022, but Charlene's family were a part of the Purge in 2010, which is 15 years before election year. So the Purge may have been happening for at least 15 years up until election year. Number 40. Coincidentally, the new founding fathers came into office was the same year the Purge came out in theaters, 2013. Number 41. No one knows exactly how or why the new founding fathers have taken over America or how they were voted into this new world, but we do know that their first order of business was to deal with crime in America. Thus, the Purge was born. Number 42. Have you also wondered where the house in the Purge was located? Well, forget it. Jeanette Volturno Brill, head of physical production at Blumhouse Productions, was banking on you not pinning down or knowing where the actual home was located. They wanted it to feel like it could be anywhere. Number 43. The Purge might have never happened if DeMonico's first idea to do a slap 
slasher horror film starring Ethan Hawke would have followed through. Unfortunately, production fell apart on that project and they lost financing. Number 44. Hawke was an easy go-to name in Hollywood for the producers and a particularly good one to kick off the series. It was predictable, however, because Hawke had worked with DeMonico before and is said to enjoy such subversive material. Number 45. Even when considering the possibility of sequels, it was known from the start that Hawke's character had to die. Not only because audiences reportedly hated his character, but because he had to redeem himself for making money off of the purge. Number 46. Hawk described his character as very buttoned down and square, but he has played not so lace characters before in the past, including Training Day, Reality Bites, and Boyhood. Number 47. Mary is nothing like any of the characters that Lena Headley has played before. You probably know her from the massively successful TV show Game of Thrones, where she plays Cersei Lannister. She's also starred in such hits as 300, Dread, and Terminator the Sarah Connor Chronicles. Number 48. Demonico describes Mary as someone who has been deadened by the purge. She accepts the things that her and her family have from the cost of the purge and are fully aware of the cost. Number 49. Adelaide Kane's character Zoe has known the purge her whole life. Kane says it's traumatic for her. She goes through different stages of the film from angry, catatonic to resigned. I would say that's a pretty normal reaction to legalized brutality. Number 50. Does Kane look familiar? She also has been on Teen Wolf, but her best role to date has been playing Queen Mary Stewart in the CW series Rain. Number 51. Timmy, the robotic doll-like machine owned by Charlie, is the watcher in the movie. According to DeMonico, he is the voyeur and almost the audience in a sense. Number 52. According to DeMonico, Charlie is the moral center of the story. He's questioning the purge from the beginning. Some of the audience was angry at Max for what he did in the first movie, but some find it humanistic as well. Number 53. Charlie is played by Max Burkholder, who has done some voice work for amazing animated shows. His roster so far includes The Land Before Time, Foster's Home for Imaginary Friends, American Dad, Family Guy, The Cleveland Show, Astro Boy, and My Friends Tigger and Pooh. Jeez, this kid has some serious hustle. Number 54. The Bloody Stranger, played by Edwin Hodge, is a homeless man and ex-vet. He was a target for that evening because the homeless in The Purge have nowhere to go during the night. There's no shelter for them and most people don't want to house them. Number 55. Costume designer Lisa Norcia went through almost 100 different masks, including a burlap sack like the one the Scarecrow in Batman uses and a Mardi Gras crow like a Harley Quinn mask. They finally came up with the mask which they call a really simple female mask. She said it was scarier than anything they could have created. Number 56. They couldn't find anyone for the polite stranger rule before discovering Rise Wakefield. According to DeMonico, he just kept smiling like he had some kind of inside joke with his buddies, like this was all a game. He also says everyone was scared of him on set, including Ethan Hawke. Number 57. The Purge Anarchy was layered in three different stories of strangers with the entanglement of five people trying to survive on the night of the Purge. Fuller said that he wanted people to feel what it would be like if they were out on Purge night. Number 58. The Purge Anarchy had a bigger budget than the previous Purge movie, which allowed them to do things they couldn't do in the first movie, like expanding the setting. The movie was shot in downtown LA, a city, urban environment that contrasted the film's first suburban location. Number 59. DeMonico said shooting in downtown LA was like working in a living entity. They incorporated all the sounds and lights around them, including the helicopters that frequently flew overhead. Number 60. Sometimes the locations got a little too real, though. There were an overhaul of rats when they shot Anarchy because they had to run in a lot of downtown LA back alleys to get away. That must have been pretty alarming for the rats when you think about it. Number 61. Callie and Eva were the first characters that DeMonico came up with for the Purge Anarchy. Their mother and daughter struggling in the society and struggling financially. Number 62. The economic struggles in Anarchy are quite severe. For instance, Callie and Eva lose a loved one to the Purge for a price. Eva explains that the wealthy purge by buying poor and sick people, then taking them to their homes to kill them where they're safe. Man, too lazy to even hunt for people themselves? They suck. Number 63. Each of the characters represented something different. Callie and Eva and Papa are working class individuals. They represent the struggle of American economics. Shane of the married couple Liz and Shane represents that same economic struggle as well after losing his job. DeMonico says everyone was supposed to be on that side of the table, the kind of people who couldn't protect themselves. Number 64. Liz and Shane, played by Kylie Sanchez and Zach Guilford, are actually married in real life. Number 65. The first two purges are set one year away from each other. In the first purge, unemployment is down 1% crime is at an all-time low and violence barely exists. In the second purge, unemployment went down another 5% and crime is now non-existent. Fewer and fewer people are below the poverty line. Number 66. There are certain rules you need to follow during the purge event. Ready? Here we go. Rule number one. Weapons of class 4 or lower have been authorized during the purge. Any weapon above that is restricted. In the purge anarchy, they use an explosive higher than class 4 and they were met with an extremely high-pitched noise and tear gas. Number 67. Rule number two. No emergency vehicles 
tools, including police, fire, or medical assistance, will be available during the purge event. Number 68. Rule number three. Government officials of ranking 10 have been granted immunity from all illegal activities during the purge, so good luck out there, guys. Number 69. The new founding father's prayer before the purge is really creepy. Blessed be our new founding fathers and America, a nation reborn. How much creepier does it get than that? Number 70. The voice in the first trailer of the emergency broadcast system is a male's voice. After that, the voice of the emergency broadcast is a female in the trailers and in the movie. Number 71. Frank Grillo is returning for election year, reprising his role as Sergeant Leo Barnes. Apparently, the film crew enjoyed working with him so much that they were the ones who made it happen. Number 72. It didn't hurt that Grillo made such a great impact on audiences as Sergeant Leo Barnes, so the studio decided to approach the actor on reprising his role before there was even a first draft draft of the script to display. Number 73. If Grillo's name isn't familiar to you, we're sure his face is. He has more than 58 film and TV roles to his name, including The Shield, Prison Break, End of Watch, Zero Dark Thirty, Kingdom, and of course playing Crossbones in the Captain America series. Number 74. Originally, DeMonico wasn't entirely certain Barnes would be returning. Since Grillo was also working on Marvel's Captain America Civil War, the director didn't want to make any promises. Number 75. It's possible Grillo's decision to reprise his role or not could have prevented the third movie from ever happening, or at least drastically changed the storyline. Maybe this film would be following Carmelo Johns and the Revolutionaries instead. Number 76. Grillo finally agreed to do the sequel because he knew DeMonico would be writing and directing. Then, when he finally read the script, he couldn't believe how good it actually was. Number 77. Sarge's character was an unexpected fan favorite, probably because of his nostalgic performance, which fans said is reminiscent of Snake Plissken meets Kyle Reese from The Terminator. Number 78. Sarge's character has also been compared to Moses, the director jokes that the character should have parted a sea of people. Now that is something we would like to see. Number 79. DeMonico has always been fascinated with lone wolf characters, so he had the idea for the Sarge character even before he pieced together the tragic backstory with his family. Number 80. Sarge was mainly modeled after 1976's The Outlaw Josie Wales. Number 81. In addition to his extensive acting career, Grillo is trained in MMA and can really knock a person out. It's one of the many reasons he works so well for the character of Sarge. Number 80. Even though Grillo is now known for being a street tough badass on screen, he actually got his start on soap opera television, most notably Guiding Light. It wasn't as rewarding as film, but it disciplined him as a young actor by challenging him with a new script to perform on a daily basis. Number 83. Grillo said he wasn't actually a fan of the first Purge film. He loved the second, and the script for the third was the entire reason he signed on again. Number 84. Sarge was created to uphold a moral line within the series because the movies are so dark. It was viewed as a crucial component in the story, required to add in a humanistic choice as contrast in a world rampant with murder. Number 85. Despite his winning over of fans and the crew, producers weren't entirely sure how audiences would respond to the Sarge character because of his dramatic story. They were worried it would lead to too many emotional scenes, which they felt wouldn't appeal to the film's demographic. Number 86. In election year, Sergeant Leo Barnes has the responsibility of protecting the presidential candidate, Charlene Roan, who is played by Elizabeth Mitchell. Mitchell has previously starred in Once Upon a Time, Revolution, and Lost. Number 87. Act Actress Carmen Ijogo was going to be written into the third film. When Universal approached her about reprising her role as Eva Sanchez, she turned it down to pursue other things. Number 88. The only actor who has appeared in all the Purge films is Edwin Hodge, famous for playing The Stranger. Number 89. Originally, Carmelo Johns was purposely planted in the sequel as a potential lead protagonist they could expand on if there was going to be a third film. James DeMonico knew from the very start that Michael K. Williams was the right actor for the part. Number 90. Ironically, even though Williams reportedly expected his character return to the franchise, the actor is not listed in the cast lineup and will likely not appear in the third film. Number 91. The new film has an amazingly talented ensemble, bringing in even more new characters. Election Year features renowned actors such as Betty Grable, Kyle Secor, JJ Soria, and McKelty Williamson. Number 92. Williamson joins the cast as a shop owner. You may recognize him as Bubba in Forrest Gump, Sergeant Drucker in Heat, and Baby O in Con Air. Number 93. The filmmakers weren't afraid to shoot guerrilla style when necessary. In fact, a lot of the street scenes were actually improvised. Number 94. Both The Purge Anarchy and Purge Election Year were finished within a year from script to screen, and the first film was completed in even less time. That's why guerrilla filmmaking was incorporated in the first place. Number 95. The Purge movies were extremely low budget and yet somehow turned in an amazing profit. Although most of that was pleasant surprise, it was also a strategy to increase the odds of getting a decent return on their investment. The first two Purge films only cost about $12 million to make,
bank, but made over 200 million in the box office. Number 96. By Hollywood standards, to say the franchise had a small budget is an understatement. To put it in perspective for you, the catering on the set of Oblivion cost more than the first two Purge movies combined. What were they eating on the Oblivion set? Number 97. The Purge election year was due to be released in 2015, but was pushed back to July 2016, so fans had to wait a little bit longer for their Purge fix. Number 98. When asked how would you respond to a Purge in real life, DeMonico said he would flee to Canada, while Grillo happily admitted he would Purge, just not in a violent way. Yeah, right. Number 99. In real life, DeMonico doesn't think he'd ever be able to do anything truly Purge worthy. However, in a fantasy world, don't go near his daughter unless you want your head chopped off. Number 100. Out of all the characters he's portrayed, Grillo would put his money on Brock Rumlow, aka Marvel's Crossbones, to be the best suited for surviving the Purge. Number 101. The Purge lent its annual event to Universal Studios for its Halloween Horror Nights 24. Laura Wallace wanted to bring the terrifying concept to Universal Studios. They combined the Purge and the Purge Anarchy to bring audiences the mask and the chaos you see in the two films. Number 102. The Upright Citizens Brigade actually did a skit called Seinfeld The Purge. They focused on each Seinfeld character and how they would handle a 12 hour night at a purge. Number 103. Horror comedy Meet the Blacks made a spoof of the 12 hour purge period as well. The story centers around the Black family as they gain riches and move into a new home. They hear the sirens and it's purge time as people try to keep them out of the wealthy neighborhood. It very much resembles The Purge. Number 104. For DeMonico, the overarching philosophy for all the Purge films is if there's no governing force anymore dictating our morality, how would we govern ourselves? And what's holding us in control? Is it the government? Is it the police? And if they're gone, what do we do? Number 105. A possible new direction for the future of the Purge franchise is to make it a global event. A universal exec has been ambitiously pitching the idea of another country adopting the Purge method, and it's seriously being considered by DeMonico. Number 106. However, expanding the franchise just to make a profit is the last thing on DeMonico's mind. He claimed even if it disappoints his agents and producers, he's not looking to exploit the idea for money. He only wants to tell interesting stories. Number 107. That's not to say the franchise won't expand to its fullest potential. DeMonico said that if the right story presents itself, then he will write it. So keep hope alive, guys. There may be even more purging on the horizon. Thanks for watching Cinematica's 107 Facts You Should Know About the Purge franchise. Which crime would you commit if it was totally legal for a day? Sound off in the comments, even though we're kind of scared to hear your answers. And if you like this video, be sure to check out some of our other 107 fact videos by clicking the annotations or the links in the description. We have new videos dropping every week, so let us know what you want us to cover next. And if you like getting more from your movies and TV, subscribe to Cinematica, where we help you watch smarter.